and through the mists and the smoke, I have arrived. Uh, hello, my name is Rob. I'm from that channel, Performance Check. And uh, I felt like going live. Uh, I noticed that there was a, a topic that's going around the community today about lethality, which um, is a topic that gets talked about quite a lot. Um, which I think is good. I think it's good to be constantly sort of analyzing or well, maybe not constantly analyzing, but uh, at least having an open mind to certain elements and themes and kind of uh, restrictions and what you don't restrict in your games. I think it's always good to be questioning why you involve certain things in your games. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hang around for a bit to see who joins me. Um, so I will give a quick channel update, and uh, we can go over it. Jeez. <laughs> That's what happens when you instantly drink boiling hot tea. Um, so uh, channel update, channel update. Okay, so um, I – let me think. <laughs> I should have really organized my thoughts about this. Um, so on the 17th uh, – uh, and the 18th, if your GMT Lawkeepers returns on the 17th, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I've been sort of um, starting my general procedure that I think about the what I want to achieve in the session. I'm sort of at that stage at the moment, um, sort of throwing ideas around in my mind, and then I'll, uh, I'm sure I'll sort of finalize a few things leave big old gaps for the players to make decisions and what they want to do and then we'll be away it'll be fantastic so i'm working on that at the moment that's the 17th uh i'm also now having to simultaneously think about stuff for vampire the masquerade which is really enjoyable um and much more relaxing because uh, that is literally me uh taking the reactionary role uh, as a, a gm which is pretty fun um and yeah, um, that's proving to be a, a different challenge, um, a challenge nonetheless, but uh, it's still cool. Um, so uh, I'm going to get onto the topic then in that case. Uh, so the the idea and the, the topic of lethality is something that goes around this community quite a lot. Um, and I think for the most part, most people kind of accept that it's something that's in there that provides tension. It's something in there that uh, adds stakes to the game. Um, uh, lots of people have already spoken about this in this group, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this um, on this particular thing, uh, other than to say that I personally be believe that lethality has to be in role playing games because, as Lloyd rightly put in his stream earlier, like otherwise you might as well just tell a story about how rad your players are or your player characters are rather um and go from there uh you know i i don't foresee many people doing that but anyway part of the fun i feel is that games are lethal but with lethality in your games and this is the topic that i really want to uh cover is the pressure that is involved um generally speaking if you're investing yourself into running a campaign um, like I do, uh, you as a game master can very much become invested in the story of your player characters. And it is your general desire to ensure that one, the players have a good time and also the characters have stories that are satisfying in some way. Um, which sometimes can be interrupted by the chaotic nature of the game that we're playing. D&D um, &D obviously never originally intended to be sort of a, a format for long-term storytelling, but more, you know, a game where you encounter things and see how long you can last and how much gold you can accrue and, you know, what challenges you can face. It's, it was more about that. Um, which is why that element of lethality has always been there. And I think it always will be. Um, I find it quite funny that, uh, you know, this topic... I mean, for this group, for the most part, it's fifth edition based. Uh, a lot of people, you know, that's their system of choice. It's my system of choice at the moment. But I find it hilarious because I think it's really quite difficult to die in fifth edition in comparison to a number of other 
games that are out there, many different editions of D&D, but also other games in general, I think it's really difficult to, to die. Lloyd, as I'm sure most of you are aware, has come up with critical tables and brutal injury charts to make sure that combat is more brutal because vanilla 5th edition just isn't. Even if you get smashed down to the ground and you're out for the count, you still have three rounds in which you might potentially be able to save yourself. Um, in my experience, in three rounds of combat, someone is going to be able to get to you to help you in the party. Um, obviously, there are occasions where that doesn't happen. Uh, but for the most part, I think 5th edition has a big old safety net uh, attached to it. Which, you know, is fine. I, I, I appreciate that. Like, I've had characters that I don't particularly want to die in my games go get knocked uh, down to zero or below zero, in fact, if you counted up the damage, um, where they potentially could have been killed. Uh, and it was horrible. And the reason it was horrible was because there was that pressure on me, the, the pressure that I'm um, sort of describing, the, the fact that you invest as a game master in the player characters in your game which I don't believe is a mistake, but I believe it is something that you have to be very wary of. It's something that I'm wary of. It's something that I've done. Uh, I, I'm very much invested in the story of uh, my uh, player characters in my campaign at the moment, I think. And, you know, if they, if they just happen to be killed by a stray arrow or happen to fall off a cliff uh, and die instantly, then, yeah, I'd be really bummed out because I'd be like, wow, we spent ages sort of you know, role-playing with this character and sort of making them seem three-dimensional and, um, uh, you know, like an interesting character and they have interesting story hooks and things that have been foreshadowed to happen in the future, all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, there is a threat. There is a pressure and there is a threat, uh, which I think makes it more worthwhile, personally. Um, Lloyd mentioned uh, earlier he, he did, a, he did a, a little stream. Happy birthday, Lloyd, again. Um, but he, he did a little stream where he spoke of the, um, the fact that he was pushing sort of the boundaries as Marius and the Lord Keepers. Uh, Lloyd seemed to believe that I wasn't willing to kill them. Uh, and as much as I don't want to kill them, I still have to force myself. And it isn't an easy thing, but I have to force myself to try and kill them. And I've gone about trying that on a few different occasions now. <laughs> um, I, have, I have knocked people down a fair amount. Um, there was one time in the Underdark where it, it was really the resting on two of the players' shoulders because the other two were knocked down. That was a potential. There was potential there for a TPK. Um, but I suppose it's about understanding that no matter how much you invest into the characters, you have to also invest in the fact that the reason they're good is because, you know, they are maybe not realistic, but believable uh, and sort of grounded characters that you have invested in. They're not sort of these, they're not stock characters. They're not, um, you know, you know, they're not just numbers on a character sheet. They're actually, there's actually something to them. There's actually like a shared idea. And the fact of that coming to the end on terms that people don't particularly like, I think is difficult. It's really difficult. Um, but regardless, it has to be done. <laughs> um, I, I tried to think about it. I was like, well, how could you do a non-lethal D&D story? And I just don't think you could. Um, well, obviously you can, but like... I don't think it would have any impact whatsoever. I mean, the, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think Tyler, Tyler I, I saw Tyler go live. I only caught like a tiny bit of what he was saying, uh, but he made a very good point, which was that it's what separates this from like a video game uh, is the fact that, you know, death is final. Um, now, obviously in D and D you have, uh, you know, you've got like resurrection spells and revivify, um, and all different kinds of things to either stop or reverse the killing <laughs> of a character. Um, but I mean, I I have not categorically said whether those things exist in my game uh, or not. Um, but for 
I think the, that those things do exist in one game, but for only like one person in the entire world, for example, like it's really rare. Magic is rare in my setting anyway. It's a post high fantasy setting, uh, the Nine Kingdoms. It used to be this this sort of, uh, you know, place of powerful magic and legends and monsters and stuff, but it isn't anymore. It's sort of like giving its last gasp. It's the twilight of the magical era. Um, and something new and mundane is sort of on its way. Um, which, you know, I feel the whole theme of my campaign really is about the, the fact that everything has its time. And I think it would be wrong of me to go against that concerning my player characters. Um, I see Matt Clicker here. He says, "Hey Rob, hey man, how's it going? I, I caught like a la the last bit of your Harbinger thing. I'm going to go back and watch that man because I'm really intrigued uh, by V4 the Harbinger. For those of you who missed it, go check it out on a fistful of dice. Matt, you're in the chat. Why don't you let me know how you what you think about lethality? I'd be interested to know if you have any thoughts on if any of the provokers in your second campaign at the moment, you know, what you would do if one of them met a grisly end, like." Um, do you feel that pressure too, Matt? The pressure that I'm talking about, if you've just joined me, is the uh, uh, the fact that you invest heavily in these characters. Like as a, as a games master, you think I want to help my player characters achieve like a satisfying conclusion, at least with the players, uh, player characters, and perhaps a random arrow or like a, fall, a rock's fall, or um, you know someone falls off a cliff, and that might not be as satisfying as if they got their their you know something that was a bit more fitting to the character um and how you fight that pressure i have to fight it because like i'm I, like as i i often say i have to put my money where my mouth is every now and then because i'm always going on about like oh well you should probably try and kill your characters but then when it comes into the game and you, that situation is actually put on you and say for example Lloyd's character goes to attack my main villain well i'm not i can't i can't not have my main main villain like hit back with all that he's got and I did. I, I put him on his ass with my main villain. Um, I've done the same for a few others in the game as well. Like, I've had to just be like, well, yeah, they're going to kick the crap out of you <laughs> now. <laughs> because if they don't, then it, it just weakens the story in general. It weakens the position of NPCs that you've been building up and stuff. Like, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's worth it for preserving that feeling of, you know, preciousness about player characters as much as I want them to live like I so badly want them to live but yeah um Matt says uh, I'm in the lethality is a requirement camp as a player I need to feel like I could lose it all so I tried to put forth uh, the same to my players a moment that everyone remembers in Provoker's campaign when one was Dirk and, and Dice almost died yeah man and that was just on a roll wasn't it man like you were just like well this is happening I remember watching that one live actually goodness me um yeah that was a great moment and it was only as good as it was um because of the stakes and because they were up against um such impossible odds that when they finally got through it and even then even though they got through it like one of the characters was changed forever like horribly scarred and mutilated <laughs> so it wasn't like it was uh, an easy an easy thing Lloyd Collins is here. Happy birthday to you. I'm not going to do the whole song. That'll do. <laughs> Happy birthday, man. Uh, he says, uh... <laughs> 16 sessions in, two character deaths. I think it's dishonest to try uh, to the game to try and avoid it. We are all very heavily invested in those characters and I didn't want them to die, but it has to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's sad, but you've, it, that's it. Like you've, you've just got to find ways to move on. Like the game doesn't die just because the character dies. Um, and I think Lloyd's done that really well with introducing two brand new, uh, player characters to accompany the, uh, to accompany the existing, uh, surviving party members. Um, I would have been intrigued. I didn't want it to happen, obviously, because I play in that game. I didn't want my, I don't want my character to die, but like I, I fully accepted the fact that it's likely that he will at some point given Lloyd's rulings. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Like I like that there's that level of lethality. Also it's Lord of the Rings and like people go down, like actually I'm going to say people go down heroically, but you know, 
judging the two character deaths we just experienced, it was pretty... It was heroic, but it just wasn't nice. It wasn't a Boromir death where he went down fighting. He did go down fighting, but anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, he got put down, put it that way. Uh, Lloyd says, I'm starting an Iscloth campaign this coming Tuesday. Yes, you are. Uh, and character death is on the table from minute one. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Matt Click says, the birthday boy. Yeah, also goes on to say, I'm also a huge fan of lingering injuries and things like that. Like, I want characters to be changed by the events happening around them, physically and mentally. Otherwise, otherwise why bother? I'm with you, man. Um, yeah, like we're saying, Dice getting his, his face melted, Berragond and against the shadow, losing an eye. Azerax cutting off his own hand. <laughs> like, uh, it's, yeah, it's good. And... Oh, and then Lloyd says, Matt Clay, the Iskloff Brutal Wounds can effectively retire or ruin a character after a battle, even if they win. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to retire characters. Look, I've lost the leg. I can't go on anymore, <laughs> which is even worse. That's so sad. Um, because then it effectively removes the character from the action, but they're still alive to linger on <laughs> to the end of their days, which is obviously very Iskloffed. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's interesting. Nicholas Jacquet says, hey, Rob, I totally agree with what uh, has been said. As a player, it's harder to give it, it all when I'm not afraid my, of my, for my character's life. And as a GM, I feel like I can make things more interesting when my players feel afraid. Yeah, there has to be like an element of fear, I think, um, for, you know, encounters. There's the odd one where it comes along where, you know, uh, players are, like, are, are a significantly higher level than the people they're fighting, and it's just a cool way to show how like how far they've progressed. Like, and they can just wipe the floor with people that they otherwise would have struggled with like a couple of le levels ago. Like, get that. But even then, there should be like a small threat that someone something might be able to happen. Um, yeah, like uh, I mean, I know I know this is why lethality is brought up quite a lot in this community, which is why I wanted to talk about the pressure of it instead. Like the idea that you have to sort of in a small way in a slight way divorce yourself from whatever sort of preconceptions you have about where certain characters should go and it's a lesson that i've always struggled with like i've always had to like and I, i've been disappointed in the past when certain characters that have been in my games have died um because i'm like oh no they never got to meet the person who is there i don't know like secretly like connected to them the npc that knew something about them or whatever um so yeah like and and, and going forward like uh with law keepers in particular like i don't i don't foresee me pulling any punches anymore i think we've got to the stage where and when i say pulling punches like let me explain um the 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 game that I've pulled the most punches, uh, I think it was actually the very first uh, session of Law Keepers, and let me explain why. It's something that I a, a little trick that I that I use. I think I've talked about it on one of my performance chat games. Hang on a sec, I'm just going to have some tea. So, the first ever session of Law Keepers, it begins on a really big bridge. If you've not seen it, um, a really big bridge called the Crown March, and uh, sort of the encounter happens around the idea that like part of the bridge has collapsed and there are narrow pathways across the, this massive drop which they're fighting on which for a first encounter is pretty risky because um you know if they fall off like a mountain high bridge <laughs> they're gonna die instantly in the first session uh which is kind of like the point i wanted to make i was like look this is pretty this is going to be a dangerous game but you know it's about like the epic scale as well now I knew that there was going to be that fight and I didn't really want to like say oh you get saved if you fall off that bit that was fine and in fairness one of the characters did fall off but then a Locris who is a genius when it comes to spells saved uh, Lloyd's character from falling to his death and I was like thank god I knew there was going to be a bit later on where the whole thing was going to give way okay and I knew this I, I knew that that was going to happen at some point that there was a timer on the the fight so it didn't go too long because I had a lot to achieve in the first session. I had to set up my main villain, I had to set up the quest that they were going to go on to, I had to establish the main characters and sort of let them know the general tone. I had to do a lot in that first session. So I knew that there was going to be a timer on the fight. I knew that the bridge was going to fully give way at one point and they were going to have to run away. And I decided that, oh, at that point, if they've survived the battle, then I'm going to give them an out 
uh, a safety net, as it were. And this is sort of like the peek behind the curtain, uh, which, which is that I, I had mentioned, I had made sure to mention in my initial description at the beginning of the session that the cloud march is wreathed and sort of got all these tangled vines and broken bits of scaffolding that hang off the, some of the pillars that hold the bridge up. And Locris failed his deck save and he fell. And it was good because Lloyd's character caught him, but then for comedic effect decided to let go because um his character had a spider like Locris has a spider on him and Marius is scared of spiders so he let go and I was like nope that's it he's fallen and you were like oh and I was like but actually he's hit these vines you know so there was one safety net in the fight and that I suppose you could argue is pulling a punch but because it came at that moment where it was sort of like he had technically saved him but Lloyd was just doing something to fuck about and have a good time like I was like yeah, okay, like this happened. And I didn't feel bad about that. I think I would have felt bad if I'd stopped them from dying in the actual combat. Um, so it's about weighing where and when you pull your punches. Those are the only times I think that it's acceptable to do so. When sort of the main effect of that encounter has already been achieved and you're doing like the heroic... Well, not even heroic. Like there was just like a funny moment that happened, you know. And I was just like, I'm just going to indulge them in this and allow Lurkris to hit these vines, you know, rather than have him perform excellently throughout this entire encounter. And then this last little bit where we joke around, he then dies. Do you know what I mean? Like it feels cheap. So uh, I didn't. I, I didn't. I pulled a punch. You could argue that that's me pulling a punch there, uh, rather than being no, you let go, you're dead. That like you know, you know. So that's like the only time that I'll ever do it, sort of like the safety nets that are around the encounter, not in the encounter. I hope that makes sense anyway. Um, and that's only because, as well, like it's something that you've already established. It's not a deus ex, oh, vines, you get tangled in vines if I hadn't ever mentioned the vines previously, if you know what I mean. Like, because I knew that that was going to be their purpose if something happened towards the end of the... Anyway, I'm over-explaining now. I think you guys get the point. Um, so, uh, back up to the comments, um, Matt says, I can't wait to run my Harbinger campaign. I can't wait to watch that, man. Uh, I want these guys to lose limbs, eyes, etc., so they can replace them with Necrocraft prosthetics. Yeah, man. And what I think is great, because obviously you're running the campaign to sort of get grips with, like, the kind of game it is. It's to show people what can be achieved if you, you know, play Harbinger. And that's great. Uh, and you can show off like the different things like the necrocraft prosthetics and things like that but i think it will also be interesting to see how people can get killed in armager as well like obviously there have been a lot of games so far but um yeah i i, I look forward to seeing like a lethal harbinger like a really lethal harbinger campaign because i don't think there has been a harbinger campaign has there no especially not run by you anyway um i don't know if other people have done like they've done trilogies maybe and things like that maybe that's what it is i think drake might have done a trilogy uh, Lionel says, howdy, Rob. Hey, man. Connor says, hey, Rob. Hey. Marquis says, I thought Law Keepers was over. Why, my dear Marquis, it has only just begun. <laughs> no, uh, it's not over. Um, we have done 10 sessions so far. Um, we, I would say, I, 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 to be honest, I don't want to gauge how far into the campaign. I don't really like to put a number on when the campaign's going to end. Uh, I think we're probably in pretty deep at this point, like, um, but we'll see. I, I don't. I don't know. We're uh, definitely halfway. If the at the minimum, we're definitely halfway. But I don't know. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's going strong. Um, I I I uh, continually uh, surprised and uh, happy that I've got great players that are willing to take the risks that, that I've been describing. Uh, Connor says I've been burnt by PC lethality. I ran a campa campaign that after 15 sessions had none of the original roster left, and it didn't feel the same anymore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like that's like that. That was a real risk for against the shadow that we were playing in. Um, uh, it, we could have all died, and it, it, you know, if we if one more round, and we would have all died. Uh, my character was the only one facing the Witch King of Hangmar, and as those of you who are fans of Lord of the Rings probably know that that isn't a good thing to do, um, especially when you're a level 8 ranger <laughs> against the Witch King of Hangmar. Um, got, a few, got a few hits in, though. That's, that's all I'm saying. I got a few hits in. I just want to make that very clear that I, that I managed to actually hit him, which was pretty cool. Um... <laughs> 
I'll pay for it in the future. You wait, you wait and see. I know I'll pay for it. Connor says, oh, sorry, I just read Connor's thing. But yeah, so about it feeling different. Um, yeah, I guess it can. But like the only the only positive that I can see, well, there's a few positives really, like you stuck to your guns, Connor. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think a refreshing, like it's kind of refreshing maybe to play new characters. Um, but I get what you mean that it can feel a little disappointing if you if you if the characters have been taken out and the, you know, like if, let me put it this way, let me put it this way. If the, all of the law keepers died, for example, they are the only ones that are really sort of undergoing the quest that they're on. You know, uh, it's not, it's really difficult for more people to come in and say, oh, okay, we'll do this and feel invested because all of the other characters have reasons for doing what they're doing at the moment. Um, I was really, really lucky that when I had to replace one of my players, it was early enough in the campaign so that when I, I, I actually introduced the main idea of the campaign, I attached Barker's character in with the conceit of the campaign. So I didn't, one, Barker's amazing and, and did all the work for me anyway, really. Like he he sold it with just his, his stellar role playing, but it just meant that I didn't have to try too hard to convince the players to bring him along with, you know. Because uh, he was already entwined in the story. Uh, Marky says, I'm not caught up though. Well, dude, get on it, man. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to sort of sing my praises too much, but I think it's a good game. I, I, I feel very satisfied with the way that the campaign has gone so far. And I would love to hear your thoughts too, Marky's. Uh, I respect your opinion and I would like to hear it about uh, my games uh, that I've run and those in the future. So yeah, let me know, man. Lloyd says, uh, I've gone through a big change in how I run games. I used to run narrative games where I had a really clear idea of what was going to happen. And uh, I let uh, players get away with all sorts of nonsense. Yeah, man. Um, I, t I tell you what, I uh, and this is like a, I guess it's a plug, like it's not on my channel, but I... I know what you mean uh, that, that like, I feel that there's a shift coming for me as well in a way, like, and let me explain. So uh, I, I did some audio work for, uh, I did like a very, very brief voiceover for T the writer for him to use in his latest video that I, I posted it in the group earlier. If you want to check it out, it's only a little short bit. Like I, I do the voiceover for the prologue um, and it's pretty cool. Like I, I really like it. Um, but on his channel, I really, I remembered, I was like, oh man, like this, I've, this isn't the first time I've been on this channel. I mean, me and T the writer did sort of like a channel swap, a channel invasion thing where like I did a D and D stories thing that he does over on his channel. And on that, and you can go and look it up. I, I talk about my first ever D and D game, my first ever D and D game. Um, third edition, it was even before 3.5 had come out. And, um, it was, it was just this, it was from a module that I was later reformed by someone who watched that video called The Burning Plague. That's my first ever D&D &D game. And uh, I, I happened to check that video out because I was like, oh man, I forgot I did this. And I didn't even watch it at the time I recorded it. And because of the state of my life at that time, like I recorded it, sent it to him, never watched it. I actually watched it earlier. And I was like, man, I forgot I did this. And it made me so nostalgic for the the, the fact that, you know, the, the, the goal of the game was to achieve the story at hand in the dungeon. There wasn't anything sort of overarching, all of the drama, all of the tension, everything was literally predicated on what happened from moment to moment, rather than any kind of consideration of an overarching theme. It was, you know, purely uh, sort of like a dungeon crawl really but I remember it being so dramatically delivered to us that it just felt like it felt like a movie like you know one that you don't know if there's going to be like a billion sequels like there are these days like it's just like a one-off movie and that that I think I was like oh that's great you know I, I need to sort of try and recapture that kind of feeling I think um not that I'm like disappointed with the way Law Keepers is going. I'm really happy with the way it's going. I'm just saying that, you know, I think in games that I run after Law Keepers, I think I might revert to that kind of play style. I don't know. We shall see. Um, Lionel says, uh, I love uh, Brutal because it makes uh, players and... I love Brutal because it makes players and in connection their characters think twice about combat. Yeah. It does. Like deciding to whether or not to go into a fight and having to consider, well, do we have the resources? Do we have the physical resources? Like, do we have the energy to fight? Like, are we critically injured? Do we need to actually flee from the enemy or do we stand a chance? And also, do we want to risk it? <laughs> do we want to risk a stray arrow hitting us in the chest? 
in session one and crippling us, you know, like it did in Against the Shadow. Um, or, you know, someone having their leg broken. It's, uh, yeah, I like it that it's like, oh, God, we're going to get into a fight. Oh, it's going to happen. We can't avoid it. And sometimes you just think to yourself, well, screw it, like, screw the risks and you go in, like, and your your heart's racing because you're sort of like, we're just committing to this fight and we're going to fight. And if we lose, we lose, but screw it, let's just do it. So either way, like, I think it's it's pretty cool, a very cool experience. Lloyd says, I was afraid that killing players would make them dislike the game. Not afraid of that anymore. Thanks to the lessons from Ian, Nap, and Nico. Absolutely. Like you've you've listed three of the uh three kings. <laughs> three kings of lethality. <laughs> well, I suppose you'd be a fourth king, Lloyd. Um but uh yeah, no, that's fair play. And I don't think anyone would dislike the game anymore. Like I wouldn't dislike against the shadow if Faroth got killed. Uh, and hopefully you wouldn't dislike the game if Marius got killed uh, for Law Keepers. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Connor says, having my character die in one shot feels great. Well, that's the thing. That's This is why I think campaigns generally are better. Like, And, and, I, and I know I talked about this before, and I appreciate one shots for what they are. But you cannot beat the idea of like the investment in something like that dying rather than, oh, well, you know. It's fine because like it's only a one shot. If, my, if I die, I die. If he dies, he dies. Um, so yeah, um, but I'm with you, man. Like it is good fun when you just get like taken out, like like in a horror film or something. You're you're the first to go or whatever. Nicholas Jacquet says, uh, Connor Davis, same happened to me. The whole squad died, and I felt the best thing to do was to start the whole campaign again. But ten years after the events, players agreed it was the best way to continue. Yeah, like, and then you can show the impacts of what happened because they failed and stuff. Like, I think that's a, it's a tried and tested. Uh, I think a lot of people enjoy taking the jumps. Matt clicks provokers 20 years in the future. Um, I hear, I'm not a fan of this, but I hear that's what Critical Role are going to be doing. They're going to be like jumping ahead into the future to see sort of the impact. So success or fail from the party, it isn't, it isn't necessarily a negative thing for your general campaign world. So it's just something to be embraced, I suppose. Lionel says, three of my four player characters died in an Iskloft one shot and under three rounds. Welcome to Iskloft. Matt Click says, I think there's a balance that can be uh, striven, uh, striven for for making death a reality and letting your play PCs feel like badasses. Like, it's okay to softball an encounter at your players, just as it's okay to hit them with an encounter that you know full well may result in some deaths. Yeah, like I know there are definitely some encounters that I've run in lots of games where I'm like, you know, this is going to challenge them in a certain way, but I don't expect it to kill them, nor am I intending it to kill them, but it could, but it's unlikely. And there are some that I'm like, yeah, I want them to be afraid and I want them potentially to lose this encounter or I, you know, I want them to have that feeling like, oh my God, what are we up against? Um, are we in our, over our heads? Like, because you can only gauge if you're in, if you're in over your head the whole time, if you're fighting for your life the whole time, like you're like, oh, I do become desensitized to it. Like, and I think in some ways that's really effective. I think in other ways it's not. For Against the Shadow, I think it's really effective because uh, Faroth, to me, it seems more like a sort of like a, a broken veteran, a survivor at this point that's just like, he just knows that any time could be his last. Like he fully knows that and fully accepts that. So he doesn't hold back in fights anymore. He's just like, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Uh, and I think that that informs the character quite a lot, which I think is really great. Like it's just sort of like the constant threat that something might might get you. And yeah, but I think in others, um, yeah, like I think it's good to have a mix and know that you, you're, you're going to be okay and be badass, like you say, Matt. I completely agree. Uh, ba -ba Marky says there is a Harbinger campaign run by Drake. Oh, did he actually run a campaign? I know he did. Um, I, I thought he was doing a trilogy, or he did a trilogy. So that's cool. Well, check that out uh, on Drake's channel. Uh, Marky says it's going. Me and Lloyd are players in it. I, I didn't know this. This is really cool, man. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Marquis, it's only uh, it's the only time Lloyd see me play a character that wasn't some pretentious bullshit. <laughs> Are you still not convinced that that's ever happened, Marquis? 
no, man. You're great. I don't know why you're saying that, man. Like, I really like the characters you make, man. Plague Bird for life, man. Uh, for those of you that want to see Marquis' greatest character of all time, in my opinion, uh, check out Shadow Under Lockdown, which was a one-shot on my channel where he played the Plague Bird. Just great. Um, Lloyd says, uh, I love uh, Sethius. He's rad. Yeah, I was going to say, like, generally, Marquis, you make pretty damn rad characters, man, so I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. Um, <laughs> Lionel says he's a dick. And uh, now they're just like uh, talking about this character that I have no, you know, d don't mind me, guys. You know, I'll, I'll just I'll just like pretend to know what you guys are talking about and try and involve myself later on. Um, Marky says, play bird, never forget. Soul survivor, man. Uh, there you go. Like there, there was another um, game where lethality was on the cards because, yeah, it was a one shot. Like I say, like. Um, what I didn't even, you know, I was like, yeah, the the, the guys are going to show up with their a bit of information that they have to deliver to this this really weird sort of cult like organization known as Advent. We've got to just drop this information off to them. Oh shit! The main villain from my campaigns there, and he's murdering them. <laughs> At the end, <laughs> like that's um, yeah. So that that was a good way of me using a one shot to show like that. My villain, once again, doesn't mind just murdering people. Like, that's a lot of what he does is just murdering people. He has a very good reason for doing so, in his mind anyway, but uh, yeah. Um, so maybe one day he will he will get the drop, finally, um, on them and finish them. We shall see. Um, join me on the 17th and find out if um, someone yeah, bites it. I don't know if they will. <laughs> I'm not planning for it. Uh, but I, I want to I want to sort of take steps to ensure that it's always going to be a possibility. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is the thing that Lloyd mentioned about testing um, testing people. Uh, testing people in their games as to what how lethal they're going to be. And I, I could sense for a while that Lloyd was doing this. <laughs> Uh, in a particular session where the law keepers were outnumbered against, uh, and this, I won't spoil it, Marquis. I know you said you might watch it, but um, so I won't spoil it too much. But there's a session where it's the law keepers in a small town against an army uh, of a thousand. Um, and Lloyd very much understands <laughs> sort of medieval esque warfare, as most people do in this group, and that if you are one person and you are fighting. 20 people who just swarm you then you're probably going to die um and i i'm glad to say that in that session i was ready for that and i was like you know what no matter what happens like i've i've set these stakes i've put an army on their doorstep they should act accordingly and efficiently to try and kill them and i nearly did i very nearly did uh it just helps that the other players were on it because Lloyd was uh, testing me, and yeah, which I suppose is another point about pressure. Was Lloyd pressuring me to kill him? You know, uh, is that a good thing? Um, I think it's a good thing in the sense that everyone is entitled to have the game run in a way that they enjoy, and Lloyd uh, is entitled to that also. And if Lloyd enjoys the fact that there's going to be one hundred percent no holds barred sort of attempts on his life, then I, as a DM, am almost obligated to facilitate that. Um, I always like to say it's becoming my catchphrase. It's not just your game, it's everyone's game. So, yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean for this to go on as long as it did, uh, I because I saw no one join me for a while, so I, I thought, well, this is going to be a short one. Uh, but I really enjoyed talking about this one. Good to see uh, some really great comments from people in the community. Um, so I'm going to have a sip of tea and a puff. Uh, any further thoughts I'll read out. Otherwise, I will call it a day. Speaking of lethality, I'm going to go kill some orcs in Shadow of War, I think. Yeah. I think that's me. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. But... Um, yeah, just just try and consider to yourself or how you know how about trying to sort of be be a bit more hands off in running your games. Um, you know, perhaps the outcome that happens beyond your control might be better than the one that's in your control. 
I think most of the time that is true. Um, as much as I like to say, oh, you know, I, I think to myself, I can run some pretty great games, um, but it's only because of the input of people and situations beyond my control adding to that that make it, you know, even more enjoyable than what it would be if I was just calling all the shots. So it's something to consider anyway, and, and to try and not allow that pressure to sort of, to, you know, dominate your thoughts when running encounters. Oh, I don't want my player characters to die. Well, accept that they can, and that pressure will go away. <laughs> Lloyd says, uh, I'm uh, simply unsure. I was simply unsure up to the point if you were going to cross that line, but you were definitely going to. I was ready and willing to face the music for my actions, and I think the game is richer for it. I agree, man. Although I slightly disagree because I nearly killed you in Mind Flares as well. So, you know, <laughs> up to that point. But that's another story. And that's like the ending of the never ending story, which this is not going to be because I'm going to terminate the uh, the, the the live chat thing. I'm going to stop this. Just stop it. Okay, just stop it. Thank you ever so much for watching there, guys. Really appreciate it. Like this chat. This is a good one. Um, as much as we talk about lethality, there's always more stuff to talk about. So what are your thoughts on the pressure of lethality? Let's keep this conversation going. I would like to hear people's thoughts on, you know, do they feel pressure to do that in their games? And if so, how do you react to it? Let me know. Tag me in uh, live streams, man. I expect one from Marquise at some point. I know he did a really cool one about uh, Iskloft that I really enjoyed watching. It's just a short one. But uh, so maybe, maybe we'll hear from him. Maybe. Maybe we'll hear from Matt. Matt's done something today already, though. Just someone. Do something. Keep the ball rolling. Thanks for watching. Hope that all of your performances are up to standard.